For the next few moments, we'll turn our attention to the Word of God recorded in the book of Philippians, the first chapter. I'd like to read some verses from that chapter now. If you want to follow along as I do so, please turn to Philippians chapter 1. We'll be considering uh, verses 9 through 11, but I would like to read from verse 3 so that we have the context. Philippians 1, beginning at verse 3. If you're able, would you please stand as the word of God is read. The words of the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, for whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Thank you. Please be seated. Lord, we have come to worship you, but also to sit at your feet and learn. We have so much we need to know. And you have so much I'm sure you want to tell us. And so in these moments, Lord, help us to hear your voice, to understand your truth, to sense your leading. Speak to your people this day, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. It's hard right now when you look outside to think that in a couple months or so, the lilacs will all be in bloom. I happen to like lilacs, by the way. I love the way they smell. I think it's just so so absolutely beautiful to see a big stand of lilacs somewhere all in bloom. I'm going to tell you what I call a tale of two lilacs. These stories are true from my own experience. First church that I served in Maine when I moved into the parsonage, there was a small lilac bush near the door that went in and out. The first year I was there, it put out three blossoms. The next spring, it put out three blossoms. At that point, I got married to somebody who has a green thumb. And I said, how do we make this thing grow? And Wanda knows, as you all know, she's extremely talented in gardening and growing and all of those things. She said, well, you know, this, that, and this, okay. So she took care of it beautifully. Next spring, three blossoms. I said, sweetheart, didn't work. She did some other things. The last spring we were there, we were there three blossoms. That's the first tale of lilacs. The second is the next church that we served on that property had a really beautiful old stand of lilacs way in the back where it couldn't be seen much except through our back window. And Wanda said, boy, you know, wouldn't it be great if people could see that from the street? And we had a place where it looked like there'd be a perfect place for a hedge. And so she began to plant every year a few little cuttings and seedlings, you know, to hopefully to create a hedge. And by the time we we left that church, they still looked like these spindly little things that were, were there, didn't look like much. 
Last year, we happened to drive by that parsonage, and guess what? There is a beautiful hedge that has grown in over the years uh, of lilacs. It's just spectacular. A tale of two lilacs. One just keep not growing, not really achieving much, just putting out the same three blossoms year after year after year. In another, growing and reproducing and becoming an absolutely beautiful hedge of lilacs. What is the purpose of a lilac? It's to put out blossoms, right? That's why we have them. The more the better and produce offspring. If a lilac doesn't put out blossoms, then it's just a green bush, right? So which one of those two blossoms, the first one I described, or, or, or I should say, uh, which one of the lilacs was the most fruitful, most successful, obviously the one that grew into a beautiful hedge. Seems to me that there is a parallel here for us who believe in Jesus Christ. There are those who claim to be Christian who seem to just keep putting out three blossoms every year, never growing, never going beyond, never reproducing, but just simply being the same and at the same level of spirituality in their, their walk with God year after year after year like that three lilac bush. And then there are those who grow and reproduce and keep bringing forth more fruit and more fruit and more blossoms as they go through life. I'll let you answer for yourself which one you most resemble. But it's important for us to think this way in terms of fruitfulness, in terms of growth. Jesus once said something that I don't think gets enough attention. Jesus said many things, and it all deserves our attention. But in John 15, 8, Jesus says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Let me read that again. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. You want to glorify God? According to Jesus, it's by bearing fruit. You want to be known as a disciple of Jesus Christ? According to Jesus, it's by bearing fruit. By this is my Father glorified. By this you prove to be my disciples, that you bear much fruit. If a person is a three lilac Christian, according to that definition, you're really not glorifying God and really not de demonstrating that you're a disciple. Not my words, Jesus' words. This Lenten season, we've been looking on these Sunday mornings at prayers, specifically prayers in the scripture that were written by the Apostle Paul in his letters to the Christians he was writing to and, of course, to us. We've already looked at two such prayers, the one from Ephesians 1, in which he prays that the Ephesians would know God more, to know him better. Then last week we looked at the one from Ephesians 3, where Paul prays that the Ephesians would have spiritual power, have the ability to be able to do the things that we need to do. Today I want to look at this prayer in Philippians chapter 1. Many of you know that the book of Philippians is a very uplifting, positive, joyful letter. In fact, probably the most joyful letter that we have in the scriptures by Paul. It's, but Philippians have been called Paul's sweetheart church. It's full of hope and joy and encouragement. If you're ever down in the dumps and you want to know where to read in Scripture to pick yourself up, read the book of Philippians. And it's meant all the more so because when you realize that Paul wrote this very positive, encouraging, hopeful, joyful letter while being in prison. Well, he writes in chapter 1. He has some very affectionate things to say 
concerning his relationship to the Philippians. And then in verse 9, he says this, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul prayed that the Philippians would be filled with the fruit of righteousness, that they would be righteously fruitful, that their lives would demonstrate fruitfulness, and that fruitfulness would be a righteous fruit that would be produced in their lives. That was his prayer for them, that they would live righteously and that that fruit would be obvious. So how do you get to the point where you're a fruitful Christian? How do you end up being somebody who produces the fruit of righteousness? It doesn't just happen. There's things that have to take place in order for that to happen. And as you read this prayer, you realize that Paul has sort of given us the formula for how that happens, even in the way he prays. And so I want to go through this prayer step by step so you see the progression. And then at the very end, we see that all of this will produce fruitfulness of righteousness. How do we get there? Well, the first step, he says, is love. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Love is the first thing that he mentions. This is not unusual for Paul to do. Many of you will know, and maybe have even been thinking already in terms of where I'm going with this message, of a passage in Galatians that we call the fruit of the Spirit, where Paul lists nine virtues or nine character qualities that God wants to produce in his people. And you probably might even be able to recite the list. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Notice what the first one is. Love. There are some commentators who suggest that perhaps love is really the fruit and all the next eight are all just stem from that. There may be some truth to that. Love comes first. Here in Philippians, here in the list of the fruit of the Spirit. And then if you go back to another Paul's writing, one we know very well, 1 Corinthians 13, where he talks about how whatever we do, if it's not motivated by love, it doesn't mean anything. And then at the very end of the chapter, remember how he says, now abide these three, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what? Love. So Paul thought love was pretty important. He always places it first. But he's the only one to do that. Do you remember when Jesus was on earth and somebody came and he said, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Remember how Jesus responded? He said, The greatest commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. Love was first. And Jesus also said something else about love. He said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Thus, love repeatedly is mentioned in the Bible of being primary importance, of primary importance. So if you want to know how to be fruitful for the Lord, it begins here with love. Why is love of such paramount importance? I thought a lot about that. And I don't know if this is the right answer, but perhaps it's because love, when we are demonstrate love, we are loving, we have hearts of love, we most 
reflect who God is. God is love. And when we are loving, when we have hearts of love, then we most reflect who he is in his nature. If you want to put it, we're most like God (laughs) when we love. And so love comes first. Love is sort of the matrix. It's the foundation out of which everything else grows. Love is at the very heart of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Why did Jesus go to the cross? Because he loved us. We are closer to the heart of God when we love than at any other time. The more loving we are, the more like him we are, the more righteous we are. In Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3, we looked at last week, he spoke that he wanted his readers to be rooted and established in love. Grounded in love. Here in Philippians, he says that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. That it would grow. So how do we produce fruit in our lives? It begins here. It begins with love. There's no other place to begin. But in his prayer, he, Paul goes on. He says that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of sight, so that you may be able to discern what is best. The next step, first love, now discernment. You know, I looked up the word discernment in the dictionary this week. You know what it said? Making judgments and being discriminating. Now how about those for two buzzwords for today you don't want to be accused of? Judging and discriminating. So what does he mean by discernment? Obviously not judging and discerning in the sinful sense of those terms. I think it's this, that life really is a series of choices. Do you know how many choices you've already made today? Oh, they weren't, maybe didn't seem like major decisions in your life, but you you chose to get up, you chose what you wore, you chose that you were going to come here or not, you chose what you had for breakfast, or maybe in some cases people chose all those things for you, but nevertheless, choices were made. We make choices all the time, and our life becomes a result of those choices. When my girls were growing up, they got tired of me saying this because I said it often, but it was one of the major messages I wanted them to understand about life. I used to tell them that they could choose. They could choose all sorts of things but they could not choose the consequences of those choices. Yep, you, can, you have the choice. You have the decision. You have the free will. You can do this if you want. You can do that. You can do that in life. But what you can't say is, I choose to do X and I demand that Y is the result. God is the God of the consequence. You reap what you sow. And God determines that. Choices are so important. So what is Paul saying here? He's praying that the Philippians would have discernment so that they could make wise choices. And in fact, the way he puts it is, so that you may be able to discern what is best. How do we become fruitful? It begins with a heart of love, and then it goes to discernment. Choosing using our wills, which we all have, to make choices for that which is best, discerning what is best. And I don't think he's talking necessarily here about things like what am I going to do for a living and who am I going to marry and where am I going to live and those kind of things. I think he's really talking about here discernment in terms of 
moral choices in terms of right and wrong, godly or not godly, scriptural or not scriptural, discerning, be able to say, what is God's best in this situation? How would God have me to act? How would God have me to choose in this situation between right or wrong? Every day we face such choices. Are we going to do things God's way or somebody else's way? Paul prays that the Philippians would be discerning what is best. A few years ago, there was a real craze, you'll remember it, WWJD. What would Jesus do? Don't hear about that as much anymore. It was kind of a fad that lasted for a while. But I think what Paul is saying here kind of bleeds into that somewhat. What would God have us do? What is best? What is God's best in this situation? Now, in order to say that and to pray that, we have to honestly and truly believe that what God says is best is best. You ever argued with him about that? You ever thought that maybe you had a better handle on what was best than he did? Honestly? We have to truly believe, if we're going to discern what is best, that God's ways are best. And you say, well, what are those ways? Well, folks, got a whole book that tells you that. We need to know what it says so that we know what those best ways are and then discern in every given circumstance what that best way is. So to be fruitful, it begins with a heart of love. It goes to discernment. And then finally, he completes his prayer by saying that you may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. Purity, which should be the result of discerning what is best purity. You know, the subject of purity isn't spoken of as much today as it used to, and I think that's true even in Christian and church circles. Purity. Why is that? Is it because the word kind of sounds old-fashioned? Is it because we're afraid to be thought of as legalistic or narrow-minded? Purity. You talk about purity in the public square, you're in danger of being mocked. That's an old-fashioned concept. And it may be mocked in our society, but it is still precisely what God wants from us. He wants us to be pure. Not 99 and 44, 100% pure, like ivory soap, but pure. God hasn't backed off on that. God doesn't take the temperature of the culture and then decide what his expectation is going to be for us. He's made it very, very clear. He wants his people to be pure and holy and righteous. The scriptures say that he says, Be holy as I am holy. And I don't find any scripture or anything since that God has said, no, I think I'll change that. Still in force. The commandments are still commandments. The principles are still principles. The precepts are still precepts. They haven't changed. We need to pray along with David in Psalm 51, create in me a pure heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Purity. Yes, God still wants it. Thankfully, we are able to confess our sinfulness when we are impure. And he forgives us because of what Christ did on the cross. But that doesn't mean we should not strive to live pure holy, righteous lives. As I said, God hasn't backed off on that. He still 
wants that of his people. So, let's look at this prayer again. This is a powerful prayer, isn't it? That your love may abound more and more in, uh, excuse me, in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you be able to discern, discern what is best, be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. And what's the result? Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You know what this prayer is? It's actually an equation. Those of you who like math, you'll like this. And those of you who don't like math, just endure it. But it's really an equation. Love plus discernment plus purity equals fruit of righteousness. So not only is it a prayer, but it's also an equation of how you get to be more than a three lilac person forever and ever and ever. Love, discernment, purity. As you think about your life, you think about the fruitfulness of your life and hopefully desire to grow in being more fruitful in Christ. Where do you start? Maybe praying this prayer and inserting yourself, praying it in the first person. And this is my prayer, Lord, that you would help my love abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, that you may be, that I might be able to discern what is best and that I may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ so that I will be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What would happen if we prayed that? We often say God answers prayer, right? You think he would answer that prayer? I think that's exactly the kind of prayer that God would answer. Something to think about as we go through this Lenten series, as we think about and spend time meditating about where we are in our walk with God. Come back to Philippians 1 and see if there's something here that might be of benefit for you to consider as we go on with our lives and hopefully be those who are not just three lilac people, but be those who put out an entire hedge of beautiful fruitfulness for the cause of Christ, for the cause of Christ, for his glory. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this passage. It is rich, and we've just scratched the surface of it. But help us, Lord, to understand more and more what it is you want us to be and to be like and how to get there. Thank you, Lord, that you promised that you will help, that you will grow us if we'll let you. Show us, how, Lord, how we can see true growth in our lives, continual growth as you lead and direct us. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.